After eight years of waiting and enduring several delays, gamers around the world cried out as they crashed the Steam servers and fired up their consoles to welcome their long-awaited Messiah, a true next-generation game that was prophesized by the country of Poland to change the landscape of gaming forever. Welcome to the next generation of open-world adventure. Oh boy, did it. Cyberpunk 2077 was developed by Geraldo Good EA Bad and is the canonical video game adaptation of the tabletop cyberpunk series. It's not only the most immersive cyberpunk themed media out there, but it is also the most immersive game I have ever played. In an alternate dystopian future that is literally darker than a DC film, everybody is pimped out in chrome. Fresh water costs 99 euro dollars a gallon, and mega corporations have become more powerful than governments. Wait, I thought this was supposed to be an alternate future. You play as V, a gun for hire who is trying to stay alive and become a legend in Night City, which is quite an oxymoron, as the conscience of part-time rocker, part-time terrorist Keanu Reeves lives inside your head, rent-free. You can craft V to look exactly how you want, from head to head. You can even adjust the size of your nut cannon and decide if you want to wrap your pig in a blanket. Even feminine bodies can pack heat, so you no longer have to choose between the headlights or a stick shift. And just like that, you've made your first big decision in Cybercock 2077, as your choice of body and voice type also determine who you can and can't Bang. romance. And that, and you can't even get so much as a haircut in Night City. Maybe we should just turn one of the fun houses into a barbershop, but it wouldn't be Night City without a sex reference every 12 seconds. Huh, would you look at that? Yin and Wang. It upsets me that I can't upgrade my pocket rocket to a literal pocket rocket, as even after I helped Flaming Crotch Man with his defective dumb, he bragged about getting an upgrade to his Willy Wonka. But then again, you can't actually see your meat thermometer in game anyways, despite being able to customize it. But enough about V's meat and potatoes, what about the game's meat and potatoes? Like every other RPG in existence, or at least the RPGs I've played, you can level up and upgrade your attributes and stats. These stats affect how adept you are at killing, surviving, or arts and crafts. But stats don't mean shit without proper gear. And thankfully in Cyberhunk 2077, your body is the gear, as you can augment and upgrade various aspects of your fleshy tomb. Upgrading your abilities and body takes experience and money, and at the beginning of the game, you have neither. So you're stuck playing Call of Duty, For Honor, Watered Down Watchdogs, or a worse version of any stealth game ever invented. So I see why many people got bored quickly before you could actually start having fun as a cyborg demigod. You can use guns with bouncy bullets, chargeable bullets, and bullets that do all the aiming for you, and they're all really boring. In a game where you can fire rockets from your wrist, make enemies commit seppuku with your mind, and slap them silly with a willy, why the fuck would you ever want to use a gun? I started my first playthrough of Cyberbunk 2077 with the intention of becoming the futuristic equivalent of Skyrim's stealth archer, because the Book of Todd states, if it's broke, don't fix it. At first, I was but a wee nerd, easily bullied by my peers and always puffing my inhaler. But being a fucking genius had its perks. I stole money from every computer, tablet, and soda machine I saw, and became a billionaire overnight, outfitting myself with the greatest tech available so I could make everyone my bitch, including Night City legend Adam Smasher. I'm now able to inject COVID-77 or a mental illness directly into my enemies from 300 yards away while looking at a wall with no consequences or danger to my health whatsoever. Does this violate the Geneva Conventions? I don't know. I can't find Wikipedia on my computer. The game also has a bounty system where you receive money and street cred for incapacitating enemies, and with an endless supply of bad guys in Night City, business is booming. The only downside is that 50% of my playtime has been spent on this hacking minigame, and I'm starting to understand why Alex Mason went crazy. If using Jedi mind tricks isn't your thing, you can opt for getting up close and personal with melee combat. Running towards the guys shooting at you may sound stupid, but once you realize how busted melee perks are and your survivability is determined on how fast you finger your attack button, you'll be fine. You could be a Redditor, or you could pop claws like Robo Wolverine, but while you were busy studying the blade, I returned to monkey. And look at this monkey. Don't get me wrong, the Mantis blades are a lot of fun, and lunging like Palpatine never gets old, but this animation does, and it doesn't even work half the time. Open world with kinetic combat. Cyber Monkey 2077's fisting build is not only optimal, but a lot of fun. Similar to the Hacker Man build, you have an infinite supply of eddies and enemies can't hurt you. You might be wondering why a monkey needs money, but even in this world of extreme hypercapitalism, metal prosthetics, and high crime rates, monkey see, monkey do. By having no personal attachment to material things except for whatever clothing provides the best armor, monkey has become a billionaire cyborg with extremely violent tendencies. Your game plan when playing as monkey is simple. See enemy, punch enemy, repeat. No matter your build, combat does a great job of making you feel unstoppable, and in Night City you'll be doing a lot of it. So so I hope you don't get bored with whatever you pick. In 2077, what makes someone a criminal? Apparently, being B. Night City is an open world with crime around every corner, and the police are too lazy to do a goddamn thing about it, so they hire you to commit genocide against the various gangs that inhabit Night City. But if you do anything around a cop, including killing said gang members for them, the police won't like that, and will materialize right in front of or behind you with the sole intent of being annoying mosquitoes that slowly remove all the blood from your body. Hey, v. The NCPD got a call about a cyber psycho and actually sent a patrol this time, but it's been a few hours with no report back. Either those cops got scared and bounced, or... Anyway, 
Could you check it out for me? Be much appreciated. Like all mosquitoes, you can continue swatting at them, but in great enough numbers, you may be overwhelmed. That's why I recommend using the ancient and effective method of tactically retreating. The police have had to master the art of teleportation because they do not know how to drive in Night City. Hell, some of them don't even know how to walk, so driving in the opposite direction for 10 seconds will cause them to admit defeat. They do not have a driving AI. In fact, nobody in Night City knows how to drive. Not even you because you're too short and your feet barely reach the pedals. There is actually no AI in Night City. Just A. Now you're fucked. For a game set in the future with great advancements in technology and super smart artificial intelligence, we've progressed at least a decade in terms of how NPCs react to anything. They should call it artificial foolishness, because even in fights, the AI be dumb AF. When you're not fighting copy-paste bad guys that only exist to be repeatedly murdered by you for the cops, you're doing the exact same thing for the local fixers. Most side gigs in Night City are go here, let the bodies hit the floor, leave area, with insignificant and lame stories that only exist to pad out the playtime. Your husband hired me. Stupid! Fucking worthless piece of shit! Although good luck discerning between what's an actual side gig and what's just a car for sale. I'm convinced that too is intended to pad out the playtime. However, every now and then you'll encounter side gigs that aren't lame one-offs and actually have memorable characters or interesting storylines, like Oza Boza the Clown, the tragic story of Brendan the Vending Machine, and that time I aided in the communist uprising at the strip club. Then I get a call from Delamain that a rogue cab is nearby and I have to suffer through the game's awful vehicle handling. Well, you found me. Congratulations. No one's going to have a net. Good thing humanity in 2077 has proven to be beyond the need for cars. Seriously though, I'm not sure why you'd ever want to drive when you'd miss out on so many beautiful sights of Night City. This is one of the first games where walking around is more satisfying than driving, until it becomes easier to see the game's performance and AI issues. Night City is simultaneously one of Cyber Monk's greatest strengths and weaknesses. You can tell some poor Polish slaves work very hard and very long hours on crafting beautiful locales and models that are breathtaking even on the low graphics, but it's a shame that so much of it is broken, lifeless, or just doesn't work. Or maybe this is how it's supposed to be. I don't know, this happens so often that I genuinely can't tell if their mechanics working as intended or actual bugs. I'm glad I never paid back Vic for giving me faulty optics. Oh, and I think we can all agree that the people behind the game's music went harder than they needed to. At times I couldn't tell if my computer was about to set fire because it can barely handle the game on low graphics or because of the soundtrack. CDPR, please let me install a radio in my head so I can jam to pon pon shit while walking around. Fuck, even Watch Dogs got this right. Obviously, spoilers ahead. Except for Act 1 because the geniuses at CDPR spoiled that over a year ago. Act 1 is garbage. The consequences of each life path are minimal. It's like choosing your favorite flavor of ice cream and then still being handed vanilla. So the only life path worth taking is the female corpo path because then you talk down to service people with the exaggerated bitchiness of a white soccer mom. Have I asked you to do that? Uh, no. I just thought that things- Who asked you to think? Excuse me? I know damn well it wasn't me. Who was it? A word of advice, if I may. Do only what you're told to do. Now, what was that room number? After your five minute intro segment and you meet BFF Jackie Wells, you watch a montage representing six months of relationship building with Jackie, and then he dies. Evelyn Parker, a joy toy with a special interest in a Dorito chip and connections to a powerful Japanese man with daddy issues, immediately goes missing and dies. You don't have to pay back Vic. There's no incentive to do so as you, the player, literally just met him. Mark Henry comes out of retirement only to go back into retirement, but not before blowing your brains out with the Dorito still inside your head because, uh, plot. Then he dies. T-Bug just dies. I actually almost forgot about her. If instead of a six month time jump we could have gotten to build relationships with these characters, their deaths and consequences of our actions and the heist would have felt meaningful, but none of it did. CDPR succeeded at turning what should have been emotional and meaningful moments into a comedy. Bra fucking foe. V even admits there's so much they don't know about Jackie when going through his garage after he dies. A garage they didn't even know he had in the first place. I got more emotionally invested in a side gig with my neighbor Barry because I actually sat and had a conversation with the man and learned about him. That and I too talked to animals. Gameplay wise act one isn't much better unless you do as many tedious side quests as possible to gain enough experience street cred and money to play with the fun toys the only redeeming part of act one is getting cat called by a nine foot cyborg while doing a brain dance you look like a cut of fuckable meat are you it's a shame this really unique mechanic is incredibly tedious and boring and instead of story missions it would be cool if i could use them for what's really important Flog in the log. You should just be able to start the game in Act 2 when it really begins. After terrorist Neo Matrix is into your head, a constant struggle for control over your body begins, and, if left unchecked, the Dorito in your neck will kill you. Whether it's through dialogue or a Red Dead Redemption 2 Easter egg, the game constantly reminds you that you're sick and dying. Despite doing an excellent job of making you feel like an unstoppable force, the plot shoves an immovable object near your way, and it's really unharmonious. I'm okay. What's killing V is the plotline, not the relic, so as long as you don't do any more story stuff, you don't have any more coughing fits or relic malfunctions, just the occasional rocker boy hallucination. What the and fuck, also, Johnny? Let me pretend I exist sometimes, okay? Actually, as long as you never put the chip in your head in the first place and escape Compeki Plaza safely, you don't have to worry about any of that. Seeing the major leaks, Jack. 
Time-sensitive plots in open-world games don't tend to work, especially here where the game keeps suggesting, hey, if you don't get a move on and uninstall Schizophrenia.exe, then you will become Keanu Reeves. And the man has endured quite a bit of tragedy in his life. I'm sure he doesn't wish that on anyone else. On the note of Johnny Silverdick, the flashback missions felt like I was playing Doom Eternal on easy mode and I could take on God himself. They were really fun, even when the game glitched and I had two pieces of music simultaneously playing over each other. The Johnny Silverhand acting and cutscenes are uh, hit or miss, however. Oh. The rest of the cast, however, do an excellent job bringing their characters to life, and combined with mostly good writing, they felt like other people with clear goals, intentions, and motivations rather than an assortment of pixels. Take Placide and the Voodoo Boys, for example. They distrust the white man so much that my reward for helping them in the first place was them getting a closer look at my Dorito chip, but because I failed to read the terms and conditions, it was actually electroshock therapy. If only I had made my V a Haitian boy instead of a Karen, maybe they could have trusted me. Anyways, that's how we got the Haitian American Genocide of 2077. Plus, I really wanted Placide's jacket. Many missions in Cyberdrunk 2077 have choices and consequences. Take for example the pickup in Act 1. After helping Meredith Stout, she suggested I could do some more work for the American Megacorp Militech down the line. She texted me to meet, and I showed up expecting to talk shop, when suddenly scissor me timbers it's a sex scene. Guess the corporate gods weren't willing. Choices don't have some crazy butterfly effect, and for the most part, the results are inconsequential. This is actually super meta, because if you made the choice to believe the trailers, then you got corpoed. So is Cyberjunk 2077 a good game, or does it suck? Yes. Cyberpunk 2077 suffers from the Miyamoto paradox. The game is obviously delayed, yet clearly rushed. What the game does well, it does really well, but what it gets wrong, it gets really wrong. To quote famous reviewer Gordon Ramsay, it's fucking wrong. The game is digestible, but with some more time in the oven, it could have been better. I'm not gonna get into the cut content or misleading advertisements, as I'm here to talk about what is, not what could have been. And being lied to by a corpo only enhances my cyberpunk Liar. immersion. But is the game fun? I spent dozens of hours exploring the beautiful night city, completing various forgettable side missions, dispatching swarms of faceless gang members who all spout the same three lines of dialogue, using small children as cover, and transportation that breaks the laws of physics, standing still because my dog was sitting on my arms, trying to discern between quests, downloading mods to fix what the developers didn't, finding hundreds of easter eggs, regressing from a badass melee build into a broken stealth build, and trying to understand if what I just saw is a glitch or a feature, and I wouldn't have done it all if I didn't enjoy my time playing Skyrim 2. Hey, you. You're finally awake. I'd like to thank my generous supporters, especially Bioballs and Isaiah, for sending me money. Because of you, I can pay for my drug and pop Funko addictions, as well as bring you mediocre content like this. Have a good one, and I will see you in the next video.